Hey, welcome to the Tales of a Gearhead podcast. This is brought to you by Cornwell Tools. They're the choice of professionals since 1919. Yeah, 1919. A little bit of quick math work. That's over 100 years of building top quality tools. I'm your host, Stacy David. All right, let's turn the key and get rolling. All right, I got some big news here today in the legal side of things that people are going to be glad to hear about getting a replica car built and buying one. Now, for those of you that don't know, I haven't been through this mess before, let me give you a little background here. Back when people started building replica cars, kit cars, whatever you want to call them, they basically were really, really hard to title. If you built, even going back to like the Ferrari Daytona that was in the original Miami Vice series, that was a replica. That wasn't a real Ferrari. It was based on a Corvette chassis. So that thing was titled as a Corvette. And so basically guys were building kit cars out of Volkswagens and, and whatever, Donor, Fieros, whatever. And that's what the title for the vehicle was. Or you would go to the junkyard and you would buy an old Nova with the title and you would pull the subframe out of the Nova and the VIN tag and you would keep that <laughs> so you would have a cool looking exotic kit car which was titled as a Nova and obviously this was not the best so throughout the years SEMA has been able to go to bat for us in legislation and be able to get it passed to where kit cars could be now licensed and titled as replicas of a like a 32 Ford or whatever. Well, now the big news is, let me read it here to you. The National Highway Traffic Administration has completed a regulation permitting low-volume motor vehicle manufacturers to begin selling replica cars that resemble vehicles produced at least 25 years ago. Well, now what does this mean? This means that it allows low-volume manufacturers to construct up to 325 replica cars a year, subject to federal regulatory oversight, keep that in mind, but it allows these companies to build these cars and sell them as a turnkey car. Now, if you haven't been around the kit car world, the reason that you have to buy a car in kit form is because the companies that were building these cars, like Superformance or Factory 5 or whatever, they could not sell a running, driving, turnkey car because it did not meet all the regulations of that car. And the government said, no, you can't do that. So what they would do is they would sell you the kit and then you would put the drivetrain in, make it a complete car, and then you would be on your own to get it licensed and titled. And now these manufacturers can go ahead and actually build turnkey cars. The government will let them title them and license them as a replica of that particular car, and you can go and turn the key and drive it off. When it says subject to federal regulatory oversight, what this means is that you can go into a place and directly buy a turnkey car, which was you were not able to do. Obviously, it's going to cost more. And one of the things that it says here is that the vehicles are required to meet current model year emissions standards. Now, it also says here that the low-volume vehicle manufacturers will be required to register with the NHTSA, the EPA, and CARB before selling vehicles and thereafter submit annual reports on vehicle productions. In other words, there's a lot of legal red tape that these guys have to go through to do this, just like your regular car manufacturers. So the government wants their piece on this, so they're going to get it. That means if you're buying one of these turnkey cars, for example, a Cobra, it's going to have to have a modern engine in it that will pass emissions. If you don't want that engine, if you want a real 427 side oiler, well, then you're going to have to buy it in kit form and assemble it yourself. But you now you have both options. For those of you that want to just go in and get a turnkey car, you can go ahead and do that. Now, because this is coming out, Chevrolet, and we're getting ready to feature it on the show, right, this season. Chevrolet, Ford, and Dodge are coming out with emission standard crate engines to where you can drop them right in and they will pass emissions. That means these crate engines come with all the proper computers, all the proper emissions parts and pieces and everything that you're going to need so they will bolt in and pass emissions. So you can take one of these engines and you can drop it right into your old Camaro and you can pass emissions and you're fine. The only problem is if you've seen these current engines, they're not the most attractive things. So if you want something that looks period correct, this is not going to work for you. Once again, you're still going to have to go 
and build it in kit form. But at least now the options are out there, which is really good news for those of you that are out there that are car enthusiasts, not necessarily car builders, and you just want to go out and buy yourself a replica of a Ford GT40. You'll be able to do that now. And somebody like Superformance will be able to sell you one turnkey. So that's good. That's good news. It keeps the car culture moving forward. Obviously, I always prefer it when people turn their own wrenches, but not everybody's capable of that, at least not yet. Once you get in there and start working on it, messing with it, obviously you'll, you'll get more wrench happy, I hope. Quick question for you. With regard to this LS crate that we got, you mm -hmm. mentioned something very important the other day, and that is if you're putting it in an older car, this is drive-by wire yeah. throttle versus a mechanical. Mm -hmm. That's something big as well. That's a big thing. Like Jonathan was saying, we just got a 427 in, LS7 that's going to go in a project. It's going to go in a um, 98 Firebird. The motor came in and it's all drive-by wire. So they also sent a complete throttle pedal that has to be put into the car. Yeah, that's going to take some time to get up in there and, you know, to make all this stuff compatible. It takes some time. They, they, they call it a bolt-in, but <laughs> as you know, there really is no such thing as a simple bolt-in. As soon as you start thinking that, something's gonna rear its ugly head. I always go back to as much homework as you can do on a particular project, the better. And that means not only checking, you know, assembly manuals and talking to tech lines of people that sell the parts, but also try to find a reputable source that has actually dealt with the parts and the installation of it, because these, these things can get big, and people tend to down-talk that. But for car people, it's just a great option. They've been working on this a long time. Go get yourself a cool car. For you guys that listen to this podcast very much, you know we talk about cars and movies all the time, TV shows, because it's such a big influence on the car culture. What we see in the movies <laughs> directly affects what we go out and buy, and a lot of times the way we drive it. And we all know the difference between a real stunt and a CGI stunt. The real stunts, there's nothing like them. If you watch the movie Baby Driver or the John Wick movies, most of those stunts are the real deal, and you can tell. Somebody is actually putting those cars through the paces. Well, I bring this up today because a, one of the most renowned stuntmen of all time, Remy Julian, passed away. And most people don't know who he is. So let's, let's just tell you a little bit about him and what his body of work covered. First of all, he became famous for doing the original Italian job. If you haven't seen this movie, obviously the remake with Mark Wahlberg and Charlize Theron and stuff and the newer Mini Coopers is a great movie. But if you want to see original Mini Coopers going through the paces, look at the original Italian job. Remy did most of the stunts in that with all of these crazy Mini Cooper stunts. Matter of fact, when he was asked later, after all the work that he had done, the guy was in over 1,400 movies, all the James Bond movies in the 70s and 80s, all kinds of movies. They asked him what it was his favorite stunt. He went back to the Italian job, and he said it was the jump between the two Fiat factory roofs because it was an emotional jump and it was difficult. Notice the use of the word emotional. A lot of times we think these guys are just going out there and just mindlessly jumping cars or doing crazy stuff. It's not. There's a lot of planning. There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of fear and adrenaline and testosterone and everything that's going through these guys because they do want to survive. <laughs> they don't want to give their life on a stunt, which unfortunately a lot of stunt men and women have or they maim themselves doing some stunt the idea is to keep themselves safe and pull off the stunt and walk away from it and get paid check out some of the james bond movies for your eyes only he did a stunt scene in that a view to a kill a license to kill and these are not the best james bond movies but the stunts are stellar so check them out just for that and that brings up a question how important do you think not only the placement of cars and trucks in movies and tv shows is but the stunts i mean do you guys care that they're if they're real stunts or if they're CGI stunts. Most people that I've talked to were sticklers for the, the real stunts. And, I mean, we'll go to a, a bad movie just to watch some great car work. And uh, I think most people feel that way. But I'm curious on what you guys think. And let me ask you this. Do you think that what you see in the movies and the TV shows affects the car culture? In other words, do you think people go out and buy a particular car because they see it? Or do you think those cars get more popular at Barrett-Jackson because somebody comes out with it? For example, if you guys have watched any of the John Wick movies at all, you know he's fond of the Mach 1 Mustang. Because of the popularity of the John Wick movies, 
do you think the prices of 69 Mustangs has gone up? Well, if you check Barrett Jackson or any of the auctions, yeah, they have. Those things are hard to get now. They're pricey. And I would say that a big reason for that is that John Wick franchise. I mean, if you go back and look at, you know, when, when the Challenger was first coming out, you know, nobody knew what it was. Then a movie called Vanishing Point comes out and all of a sudden the Challenger is the hot ticket. Of course, nothing is more an example of that than Smokey and the Bandit. Man, when that black Trans Am hit the screen, it was over. To this day, that car is an iconic car that everybody wants. Anyway, I'm just interested to see what you guys think because the more we can push these filmmakers and these television guys into using, you know, cool cars, I think the better it is for the car culture. You know, one question I get a lot when people start getting around, we start talking about projects and the things they're working on. The subject of tools always comes up and people are like, man, you know, I wish I had all those tools that you had and, and all that other kind of thing. And that's great. But listen, I started with just a small set of sockets and wrenches. And the key is finding something that's quality. And I still have those first sets of wrenches and I still use them if I need to. And it's because they are quality tools. And that's where Cornwell comes in. I know I talk about them a lot, but I'm telling you guys, anytime that you're investing in something that you're gonna do a lot, you need to invest in the best. You don't get a piece of junk guitar if you're gonna play professionally. Well, you don't get junk tools if you're gonna do something professionally. So check out Cornwell, you won't be disappointed. I've got a question for you. Number one, and take your time thinking about this, what do you think your top, you as Stacey David, are your top five either car chase scenes or car-involved movies? Boy, you know, that's a, that's a tough question because I like so many car movies. But if I had to narrow it down to a top five... And this is in no particular order because I can't lay them down into like my favorite. I mean, sure. and some of them weren't just necessarily chase movies. They were just car movies. You know, American Graffiti is just a car movie is, is one of the best. It's oh, yeah. just it's culturally correct. It just captures the car movement of the time. I think one of my favorite chases is the bullet chase. It's just phenomenal to see what they were doing. That was balls to the walls, man. Those guys, no helmets. <laughs> I mean... They were ripping those cars around. There was a John Wayne movie. What the heck was it? McHugh. It came out about 73, and he had that Brewster Green Trans Am, and it just has a great chase sequence in that. I love that car. I love to see that car in action. And, of course, they all get destroyed in the movies, which right. always killed me. Always <laughs> killed me. Every time James Bond had rolled out a cool car, you knew it was going to get destroyed. Gumball Rally is one of my favorite car movies. If you haven't seen that, you got to see that. It's just great to see a Cobra and a Daytona knocking it out. Gone in 60 seconds. If you can get through the acting, which was horrible, and the story, the back part of what they did, I think it was the last 60 minutes, is just a chase through Pasadena, California. And, I mean, it is, like, illegal they were running down the road. There's no way they could pull something like that off today. But it is amazing to see how much destruction they left in their in their wake. There was also the 7-Ups that had a really good uh, scene in it. There was Freebie and the Bean that had a really good chase scene. It's like almost all of those movies had to have a really good chase scene. Or just a car scene. Like the movie Duel is like a great car movie, but it's not necessarily a chase. It's, mm -hmm. it's just creepy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dirty Mary and Crazy Larry, you start to get in. Yeah, that was one that did a lot to solidify the Dodge Charger for me as one of the best cars. You think yeah. Mopar was like, we really need to sell. Get them in any movie you can. <laughs> you know, especially some of the movies that you're seeing coming out now where they're using new Mustangs. Oh, yeah, Ford's all over that. Sure. Transformers. Yeah. I mean, Chevrolet was all over that. That movie was to release the new Camaro. Everybody loved it. The movie came out. And the cars weren't available. It's kind of what is going on with the Bronco right now. Yeah. The Ford's come out, the Bronco's coming out, coming out, and it's not out. <laughs> what, which now that's really interesting because if you could put that in a movie, would it be an elegant scene or would that thing just outperform everybody out there? You know, it'll be interesting. I think that probably you will see it in movies and it will be a glorified soccer mom vehicle which is a real shame. The original speed, Keanu Reeves drove an original Bronco and he's ripping it through town and that's where yeah. that new Bronco needs to go. It needs to be in some sort of outdoor adventure, chase, mountaineer kind of thing. Uh, that's where I would put it. Because once you kind of establish where it goes in the film, that's kind of what the, 
the thing will become known as. Sure. Unless somebody changes it. I remember the Transporter movies. Yeah. I mean, I love those. When I first saw the first Transporter movie, I'm like, he's driving what? You know, it's it's Audis, it's BMWs, yep. you know, big sedans. And I was like, okay, this is not the car I would expect to be in a car movie. And then about halfway through it, I'm like, I'm digging this car. I got to get me one. Yeah. You know, it, it completely made me a fan of that big sedan. Mm-hmm. Even a four-door, you know. I think if filmmakers are smart and automotive companies are smart, they will continue to do that. All right. Here's a twist question for you. Dukes of Hazard television show, but instead of the car that was the General Lee, that beautiful, wonderful car, they get the Smokey and the Bandit car instead. How well does that show do if it's that car, if it's that Trans Am jumping everything instead of that Dodge? Interesting. Interesting question. See, the dynamic that you've got going there... There's so much to that question because the Trans Am was a new car. Now, if you did it now, being as like a 78 Trans Am is 30 years old, okay, it's an old car. So they kind of cross each other out. Like the Fall Guy used a brand new square body. Right. So that helped people buy square bodies, but it did not do anything for the classic culture. See, part of the magic of the Dukes of Hazard was that they had an old Mopar. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a new car. The whole story changes. The whole dynamic changes. You have like these southern redneck kind of guys doing this stuff and they're ripping these cars around. You give them a brand new car, all of a sudden they're more refined than that. The characters to me wouldn't work. You know, they have to have an old beat up. Cooter has to drive an old beat up truck. You know, it wouldn't look right for him to pull up in a brand new Super Duty. What happens if you put the Duke boys in the Fall Guy's square body? Honestly, I think that works. I think the Fall Guy was almost a another version of Dukes of Hazard. A, a, a truck kind of transcends that. As long as it's four-wheel drive, you start slamming a truck down on the ground and that needs to go in a drift movie or something like that. My thing is, if you look at like American Graffiti, that it was so much the culture of the time. And if you insert a different car, say you take that movie and put it into, instead of 1962, it's 1972. What would the cars be? You know, what would be the baddest car in the valley? It would have been a muscle car. Would it have been a 427 Corvette? Would it have been a Cobra? Would it have been a Hemi Cuda? Would it have been a 446 pack? Mopar? I mean, any of those could have filled the bill. That opens up the whole muscle car world because all of those guys know the best of those cars were pretty stinking hot. You know, big old Buick 455s, stage twos. Ah, Can you imagine that? Okay, American Graffiti, same storyline, everything the same, but it is in 72. Yeah. Like that's just, that's just so weird to think about. Yeah, the music would be different. Everything would be different. Everything. Yeah, dazed and confused. And he was driving a Chevelle, Matthew McConaughey. (laughs) (laughs) Now, now here's a crazy thing I was reading the other day. You're talking about movies and culture and and that kind of thing. You know, Clint Eastwood was not the first choice for Dirty Harry. He was third. Any idea who the first two were? Frank Sinatra. Can you you imagine Frank Sinatra? But he was hot at the time. Yeah, sure. You know, and what? 71 or whatever you're gonna sing you sing you your rights yeah he was was number one number two take it you know the second one paul newman coming off butch cassidy and sundance kid yeah sure and you know either one of those guys you know they'd have pulled it off but you remove clint eastwood from dirty harry it's like what the heck Yeah. yeah yeah i can't even imagine it i don't want to imagine it it's it's a visual i don't want Now, see, the thing is, okay, talking about car culture. I mean, you can pick a car out of every movie. Die Hard. What's the car in in Die Hard? And what vehicle sticks out in your mind? The limo could be one with Argyle. The cop car going backwards. Yeah, that's that's a nice stunt with the body laying on it. That was a really good one. And then Um, there's another one. The armored car. Yeah, yeah. There's a little car sequence as it comes up. You see it coming down the road and blow it up. And us car people are like, no, they didn't blow that up. Please tell me they didn't blow that up. Jonathan, what's your favorite car movie? It was probably the first one I ever saw, and that's and that's Mad Max. I listen, man. I gosh, yeah, I totally forgot about Mad Max. I got Mad Max junk all over here. Well, yeah. The scoop on the SR seventy one is Mad Max, and it, to me, it was the first one. I mean, Road Warrior yeah. was good. Sure. Uh, it was more, you didn't have as much of the cool blower car stuff. Ah. The first one was so... With the side pipes. And yeah. the idea of the last of the great V8s. Yeah. Like, it doesn't, I don't think it gets cooler than that. Yeah, it was a real eye-opener to Australian motoring, too. Yeah. Which is really cool. So you can see, guys, you want to start a conversation, 
with car people, just start talking about movies. You will be shocked what you'll come up with, and you'll be shocked what somebody will tell you to watch. There are movies out there that have sequences with snowcats and tractors and, you know, chainsaws and all kinds of mechanical things, cement mixers, <laughs> that are just really cool. All right, that wraps it up for us today. Make sure you get out and work on something. And if you are light in the tool department, <laughs> check out Cornwell. <laughs>